D. We're two divorced. Well, I'm still separated. Okay. Working parents. <laughs> we talk about all the things you get to deal with when your marriage ends. Like co-parenting, dating, running a household all by yourself. How early is too early for a good hard drink? <laughs> or a glass of wine. <laughs> and how do you keep it all together after everything fell apart? This is The Married Life. Life. So welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a great holiday break. And I say break with the air quotes, <laughs> because anybody with kids knows just how much of a break you get uh, when there's no school, no child care. It's really congratulations for surviving. Yeah. Like, well done. <laughs> you made it. Well done. If you came to see 2021, it took, what, six days for it to become an historic, a historic year. And we made it. We made it to whatever, whatever 2021 holds ahead. I still have Christmas photos in my background because I have not yet taken them down. They may just stay up for a year. That's entirely possible. And D has. <laughs> I have a sad little dead Christmas bush that has been bushes I think that's that's being generous <laughs> I'm gonna touch it and it's just gonna fall to pieces yeah yeah anyway that needs to go but it's sad though letting go of that stuff it's like accepting that like we're back to work and doing all these things but uh so January is a I think a tricky month for people at the best of times but I think January amidst a pandemic adds a little extra sousong of <laughs> what the fuck is gonna of happen shit. now yeah yeah so it's gonna be gonna be very very interesting so we decided uh, we would pull in a divorce lawyer to help us today. Because let's just get real here. Right? I mean, <laughs> let's just get well, legal. I was just thinking, though, about, about that. It's, and I think this January is especially kind of bleak in a way because I think everybody really wanted the ball to drop on New Year's and, and for all of the shit that happened last year to just disappear. It didn't work that way. We are so excited to have today with us Aurora Johansson, and we need her and our audience needs her as well because she is a lawyer, a mediator, and also a meditation instructor, which is just a fabulous combination. And I'm going to read this directly from your website, Aurora, because I love this. I think everybody wants this. I'm 100% committed to helping couples who are separating and divorcing make and find their peace again so they can move on with their lives. Isn't that what we all want? It's not about punishing the other party. It's not about trampling them in their spirit. It's about peace and moving forward. So I love that. So welcome, Aurora. Thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Okay, so Dee is curious. She started this and now I want to know, what drew you to this as a profession? <laughs> That's a funny question. Right? You weren't expecting that one, but it's a good one. That's what Dee does. I, I could give you my boring answer or I could give you my really egocentric true answer. Egocentric um, true answer, 100%. Okay. I wanted to see how I would do on the LSAT. <laughs> And I guess it went well. I assume it went well. It went well. But when I had the kids, sort of like a, that dark part in your brain that the mums are nodding. That's good. Yes. That kind of opens up. We've all been there. We don't talk about it a lot as mothers, but we've all been there. <laughs> Yeah, that that sort of opened up and I thought, oh, okay, criminal law probably isn't going to go with this. But I wanted to do something where I got to do representation. So advocacy, um, going to court. I enjoy going to court actually quite a lot. Preparing for court is less fun, more sweaty. But court itself is kind of where you get to be totally on and totally engaged and you're not really worrying and anxious about it anymore you're just there doing it so I really like that and having clients and working with people my favorite is the FaceTime with with clients when it was real face-to-face -face time and now the olden days yeah the olden days the yeah, good old yeah. days. are you yeah. still in court now during COVID or is that virtual as well that is virtual as well so they are now doing some video teleconference like Zoom and mostly 
appearing by telephone. Going to trial. I want a mini skirt. I want heels. <laughs> I want to go and I want to say things and bang on a, I know the judge normally does that, but I want to bang on a table. <laughs> <laughs> the judge normally does that. <laughs> when I was on mat leave both times, and, and let's be honest, previous, I was addicted to those crappy judge shows during the day, like People's Court, Judge Judy, Judge Mathis. I watched it all. And I am now, I would say I could take the bar for small claims court in the United States. <laughs> That's how I feel about medical school with all that Gray's Anatomy. I'm like, well, I could do a surgery. I got in for my <laughs> I got in for my third child's birth for the cesarean. I'm like, I cracked a joke. I'm like, I feel like I could do this on myself. I can do it myself. <laughs> the stakes are slightly lower in my scenario. Just wanted to point that out. And performing your own cesarean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slightly different. You could fall off your suicide sandals at court and she could do the emergency tracheotomy. So you Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> I love how you're putting it together. And that's a whole episode of something, our new show, Shitty Lawyer, Ill-Equipped Doctor, <laughs> coming soon. We both had the coincidence of separate, again, this is isolated incidents, but it was sort of like the holiday season kind of led to uh, sort of a parting of ways in the new year. Is it true? The January is the busiest season for people in your field of work. I was asked that question earlier today. Well, damn it, Aaron. <laughs> I can only answer, I have to give you the lawyer answer, which yes. is that based on my own experience, I think that people do tend to get together and separate, um, sometimes around other significant holidays. And I'm not really sure why that is. I have a feeling I know why January, because I, I suspect people don't want to drop a bomb on Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked about that. Even if they both know and it's amicable, you know, and then if you don't do it then, I mean, the whole year is full of holidays. Then it's Valentine's Day. Then it's Easter. You don't want your children, if you have children, you don't want them to have this negative association. And I don't know if they do or not but i know i know that most people are pretty conscientious about that mm -hmm. and i have seen an awful lot of pleadings with early dates in january where people have, that's the date of separations like january 2nd maybe they don't want it to be the first <laughs> right so you said the lawyer that was the lawyer answer what is yes. the the human aurora not to say that you're not also a human when you're a lawyer, but <laughs> the non-lawyer response. I think I gave you both. Sorry, <laughs> you, we, we got a combo. That's perfect. It had the, uh, the disclaimer that I don't really know. <laughs> and I'm supposing, but I mean, based on my own experience, it hasn't been a, a crazy month, but people often don't come to me right at what I call ground zero. I'll get a call then maybe, ah, my T I came home, my TV is on the lawn. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> and um, for real. <laughs> Amazing. Multiple times. And um, they, so they might get a little bit of like damage control advice at that time and then when we're actually sitting down to take care of business that that time has already passed that said i would really like to do more breakup mediations and what i'm talking about is not dumping people somebody tried to hire me to do that one time um <laughs> i'm sorry we're going to need a little more information on that to, for you to to be a participant it was, yeah, it was it was i knew it <laughs> was it to be a participant and like a third party observer or like you're going to do this on my behalf yes the latter, like serve yeah. them you not just served. service not no <laughs> not just service but but like um can i hire you to uh break up with my husband to let him know like you can send a letter and uh, I refused. I That's refused. the ultimate in avoidance, right? There's yeah. like ghosting, but it's hard. To, it is hard to ghost a husband like or a wife. Cease yeah. and desist. They were living together. Talking to me ever again. They were still living together. I went to <laughs> You're just going to wait every morning for the mailman to arrive. You're eating cereal and they're checking your phones and then the email comes yeah. in. And it comes in with the mail, kind of flipping through bill, bill. Whoa, what's this? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you open it? 
<laughs> I'll watch you. You leave the room. Do you just sit there and yeah. look at them? Do you smile? So many options. What do you do? So, yeah. How do you, how do you decline that opportunity? Cause it just sounds so great. Yeah. So if anyone ever tells you like all we're looking for is money, I, I know there, I have some standards. If but... anybody wants anyone dumped, I will raise my hand <laughs> She'll to do, do it. She'll do it for free. She'll pay bucks. you for the opportunity. I think there's somebody in the States who has that for a business. But um, yeah, no, I just, I, I saw that there was a need there. Um, both times that happened, I saw there was a need there. And we just talked about like how that's really difficult to do and normalize it. I mean, it's not just like getting divorced or separating. It's not something most people do more than once in their life. So why would you have any skills for that? Yeah, totally. We're not taught in school. Okay, this is how you create a budget. This is how you get your driver's license. This is how you divorce somebody. Yeah, that's right. It's it's kind of like going over one of those speed bumps that's bigger than anticipated when you go over it. And I went went over the, one of those with my my son, and we got air, and it was amazing. Right. <laughs> and I asked if he wanted to do it again, and he's like, no. Oh. <laughs> but I see in life, yeah, it's like, yeah, that is a, that is a good. It's a very long, crazy speed bump, and you get air for quite a while. But uh, it's that's a good uh, example. <laughs> and it doesn't feel so good when you land either. Yes. So. Yes. Sorry, my yeah. dog is panting right into my microphone. She's coming up. <laughs> yeah, that's good. My dog, that's one of the reasons why I came to the office instead of staying home. <laughs> so you're talking about people wanting to inter- you to intervene and, and actually do the ending of their relationships. When should somebody reach out to, to a divorce lawyer? When is the right, like best case scenario, when should you reach out? I think as soon as they have an inkling that that may be something that they want to do, and I'm not speaking tongue in cheek. I mean, when you're thinking maybe you have questions and a lawyer is the person to ask those to a huge part of my job is undoing the teachings of pseudo lawyers, because as soon as someone's separating, all of a sudden, a bunch of their friends are suddenly lawyers and giving them terrible advice. (laughs) That's not the thing that makes it terrible isn't necessarily that it's, um, you should do this bad thing. It's that it's incorrect, which makes it dangerous. Well, meaning, but missing. Exactly. And I've, I've known, like, I'm not a fan of, uh, without giving any advice here, I'm not a fan of people living together for a long time after separation. I did that. He was in a suite downstairs. I was upstairs. I would say we both agree that was not a good, good, good option for anybody's scenario. Yeah. What makes you say that? Like what sort of led you to that conclusion? I feel the same yeah. way too. Well, it's really, really stressful for people. I think this is my own personal things that your home is your sanctuary and already uh, people who are separating usually haven't had that for a really long time because their home is where their biggest stressor is. Not the other person, but just the idea that they're the relationship. And the environment that it it's that's hosting it. Yeah. That's right. And um, there it also increases the opportunity for conflict to arise. And the other thing is that often it is based on uh, misunderstandings about the law. So two things. One is more about um, how children fare in divorce and separation. And the other is this idea that if I move out of the family home, I will lose my rights to it and I'll be abandoning that asset, which just completely isn't true. You do have to do I've heard that. What is the saying that, um, oh gosh, what is it? Possession Something, is nine tenths of the law. That's the one. I think that's all that's in our minds. I don't know how it all got there, but it's been repeated several times. So I think, yeah, a lot of us believe that. I think it's probably LA law. That if I walk out, I'm like saying, here, it's all yours, right? And that's not the case. It's really not. Like people have an interest if it's if it really is the family home, people have usually got an interest in that, even if their name isn't on title. But the 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 key is being proactive and doing something about it. But then the other thing is that we have to stay together for the kids or we have to all be in the same place for the kids. And I believe what the studies indicate is that, you know, children in intact, low conflict, happier families do, you know, have sort of the best outcome. 
kids in intact, high conflict families have the worst outcome and kids in the middle are in the middle. So it is not better to be exposing them to conflict all the time and conflict as as we know, but we tend to think, especially with younger kids, oh, they don't, they don't, they're not reading between the lines. You know, I, I hope they didn't catch that look or that dig, which mm-hmm. we all do because it's like a pressure cooker when you're pre-separation, but they do, they pick up on a lot of stuff, a lot of things. I was listening to a, another interview with John Gottman, who write, who wrote, you know, the so the seven principles of making marriage marriage work? expert. Yeah. Not that I've read that or studied it trying to save my marriage. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> uh, no, never. Yeah, <laughs> yeah never read it. <laughs> um, he he was saying that you can do urine tests on children, um, and you can test their cortisol levels, and that's how you can tell if the parents are living in a high conflict or a low conflict relationship. He said, there's two ways to tell. You can sit and observe the couple having a conversation, or you can take a urine test from the kids and you That's can tell. That's wild. That's wild. Yeah. And Honey, are you stressed? Yeah. Pee on this little thing. Just <laughs> pee on it. Do it for mommy now. <laughs> we'll get a court order. <laughs> yes, to pee on the thing. I think you're stressing out the kids. I'm going to need you to do this test once a week. Oh my gosh. That's right. And that's probably what it looks like too. Yeah. I think you're stressing out the kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's just sad that it kind of makes its way into their pee. You know, you think you think you're hiding things or you're keeping your uh, your conflict kind of under the rug, but you're you're probably smart. not. What was your question, Dee? Yeah, it's, it was just about the the reasons why people are under the um, under the impression that they need to remain living together while they get everything settled. And I did hear something once. Someone sort of advised that you know by leaving the family residence you sort of are building a fact pattern that, you know, you don't want custody of your kids. And I heard, you know, you know what I mean? Like if I leave and move out and get my apartment, my partner is going to make a case for having the kids more because I like abandoned the family or, or whatever. Does that come up for you? Yes. So that is exactly why I would like to get into mediation at that ground zero time, because I'm not trying, like I said, I'm not talking about uh, doing the dumping for people, but I would really like to help people in that time of that first two weeks. I honestly don't remember the first two weeks. You'd think like it's a pretty big event, but I got separated too. And I don't really have much recollection of what that first two weeks was like, but I do remember that heading up to it, that was what I was most worried about. I wasn't worried about a year out because I know what the law says. I know that both of us uh, spent a lot of time with the kids and what's typically in their best interest is to have relationships with both parents in the vast, vast majority of cases. So what about in that first two weeks when everybody's hopped up on cortisol and adrenaline and freaked out and is just in in like a fight or flight fight flight freeze mode that's who we need the p test for is the adults forget the kids like how escalated are you okay you need a time out kind of that's situation right. the yeah. adults would break the p test <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I kind of love that you're a divorce lawyer who's been divorced, because I have to say a happily married divorce lawyer is mildly obnoxious to me. Suspicious. It's like a yeah. skinny chef. Right. It's like if you're not eating the food. I yeah. don't think I like that. <laughs> How long have you been divorced? I have been se- separated. So we had a common law relationship for 17 plus years. Oh, and wow. We've been separated for three Three, yep. Yeah. So you're on almost the same timeline. You're in the same, you caught it from D, I think. You caught it from me and you caught it from D. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I have a question for you. You're talking about like, you know, not living in that sort of toxic pot of, of uh, you know, staying too long for whatever reasons. How have things changed because of COVID? I, it's a challenge to find housing <laughs> sometimes at the best of times. Have you seen any differences in your practice during COVID? Uh, people's incomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at uh, 
there's a lot in, in family law where you've got interim stuff that's in the meantime, and then you've got sort of the long-term final way things are going to uh, settle out in the long term. But in the short term, you know, things like child support and spousal support, say you've got a one parent at home, young kids, and one income earner outside the home and the parties separate and that person doesn't want to pay any kind of support. The packages that came out from the government, which were actually pretty amazingly helpful. The Canadian know. government, to be clear for any American yes. listeners, we're so sorry, <laughs> but we right. had it pretty good up here. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know, like as in there was help, mm-hmm. but um, I don't even know what that looks like for somebody who hasn't been in the workforce and is no longer on mat leave. So that's, you know, from one side of things, but then from the other side, I've seen a lot of people who are simply laid off indefinitely or their business they worked for took the opportunity to restructure like a lot of businesses have figured out new ways of operating with covid like quite different ways yeah a lot of change all at once for everyone yeah so there's that um and then you've probably heard in the news but this is the thing is that whoever is well if the children are not in school then somebody has to be with them. So how do you do that and how do you work? And, you know, if you're working from home and being a teacher at home, helping, that's, that's hard. Um, I see, it like, people have been making do a lot from what I've seen. I think there's a lot uh, that's pretty scary to think about and I can't say that that's not out there because the people who I'm seeing are ones who either could afford to come see me or who qualified for legal aid I still have a couple legal aid files I usually do is that an option for people if they if they I prospect of paying for a divorce lawyer knowing you need an intervention of some sort but you you can't afford it is legal aid a viable option for people yes uh, you have to, legal aid is a, another place that would be an interesting, I wonder if they would do that would be, <laughs> that would be really What are you seeing but, legal aid? Yeah. yeah. How many breakups have actually, you navigated for people? <laughs> yeah. It actually would because you have to make a quite a low income to qualify for legal aid and things that they cover. And I, like I said, ask them about it, but things that they cover are sort of on an emergency or quasi emergency basis. So that thing where you need interim support right now or safety concerns, stuff like that. That is something that does seem to be on the rise is the safety issues. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen a ton more, you know, protection orders and things like that myself, but that could also be because a lot of what I do is negotiation based stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's easy for people to forget, like you hear about workplaces transitioning to 100% working from home and home is not necessarily a safe place for everybody. That's right. Uh, so yeah, like just simply saying, oh, go work from home. That's simple if you have a safe home to be in, but that's not the case for everybody. I think that's a miss. Um, that's a misjudgment on the bar, on the part of some employers, but and for kids too, some some for some children, um, without getting too much into that issue, because I appreciate our education system a lot, especially because for some kids that is their safe place. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, wh- what do you think, from your perspective in your work, it is about COVID and what we've been through since uh, early twenty twenty that has led so many people to come to the conclusion that their marriage is done? I'm an optimist. (laughs) I think that just about everything that I've seen so far that has arisen during COVID has been something that was brewing for a long time. And I've always seen that in my practice, though. I'm not peddling divorce. I am helping people out of very difficult situations. And so once in a while, I'll hear some, like a Dr. Phil quote or something that, you know, people just don't try hard enough these days, but they're forgetting that, you know, we have laws about 
having to provide the necessaries, not necessities, but necessaries. I mean, they're the same thing, I think, but it's the language of this case. You have to provide the necessaries of life for your family members. That came from the early 1900s, I think. But there were people back then who were doing terrible things to their spouses and, and families and marriages that shouldn't work, but had to. So, yeah, I just see a lot of people, anybody who comes and sits across from me, whether it's on Zoom or in person, is somebody who's had so much suffering that they can't, can't live like that anymore. When I like that reframing of it, it's not about the, the escaping something terrible. It's about like going towards something. Yes, that's true. That's true. And so, okay, so I just did talk about the terrible stuff. But at the same time, what I see is people who believe that life can be better. Otherwise, they wouldn't be making any attempt to change it. And so knowing that... I try and figure out with them, well, where do you want to be? What do you want in your life? And let's reverse engineer it. Like, let's actually build something. Instead of viewing divorce as a destructive process, let's construct something. Because yes, it is destructive. We have to acknowledge that. So is eating, actually. (laughs) It's like, put something in your mouth and obliterate it. And then it becomes the food for your body. And we won't talk about the next part, but. That, that, part's, that part's beautiful. <laughs> we have that too. That piece, just keep the analogy above the waist and it's beautiful. <laughs> we have quite a lot of that around here too. Yeah. So maybe what you're saying too is, it's, you know, you don't think that COVID is triggering all these breakdowns in people's relationships, but more that people are taking sort of this unusual, um, this unusual reality or this unusual kind of circumstance and reevaluating their, their lives and making changes, making, you know, changes that they hope are, are going to shape their life in a more positive way moving forward. And that sometimes includes leaving, you know, leaving a, a relationship behind. Yeah. Yeah. That's because, I mean, COVID was sort of a universal way to sort of remind us of life or death and and serious circumstances and the world can flip in an instant, all of that stuff. So yeah, if you're not, if you've just sort of been treading water or sort of mildly drowning for a period or really drowning for a period of time, if if this wasn't the wake up call, if this wasn't the trigger to to an ignite change in your life, what more could it possibly be? I guess it's almost like a, a near death experience for all of us at once, you know, the catalyst. Yeah. Right. And often you hear uh, people have some sort of reckoning in their lives. Like before COVID happened, they would have something, somebody passed away or they had some kind of big change in realization and started waking up and going, oh, this isn't, this does, it seems like we can do better. Like it seems, I I think that um, life is one of those things where it's not an obligation to somebody else, but like we have this thing. If you believe that it's a valuable thing, that you have this life, even if you're really, really depressed. It's like, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to sit on my couch and eat cornflakes and drink beer all the time because I'm so sad? <laughs> or <laughs> I love that combination. Cornflakes. Yeah. And beer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great combo. It's what's left in my fridge and what's left in my cupboard. Yeah. <laughs> is that like the beer is instead of the milk? <laughs> I, I feel like it's accompanying rather than dousing, but I could be wrong. <laughs> but I hear, I love that. I love what you're saying. It's like, that's the, yeah, it's a sort of a moment of reckoning in your life. And, and, and that's what I'm curious about in your practice. You talk about mindfulness and I don't think that necessarily comes to the top of mind when you think about divorce law and separation and divorce. So how did that get integrated for you and how do you weave that into your work? I was looking at uh, a lot of my files and noticing that I was doing a lot of more um, courtroom stuff, less negotiated outcomes and noticing that all of my files that were burning up all the time seemed to have the same three opposing parties on the other side. And one of the things that's common to high conflict people, people with more of those traits, is a lack of self-awareness about it. And you're not going to teach them 
about it. Um, in fact, to do so can really toss gasoline on the whole conflict. So I noticed, though, that the clients also who were doing best like six months or a year out all had this thing in common, which seemed to be self-awareness and knowing not necessarily where they wanted to go, but like where they wanted to be mm, with their spirit. I don't mean necessarily spiritually, like religion. Like a state of mind sort yeah, of thing, right? exactly. What state of mind do they want to have? And, and had moved towards that. And it seemed like, yeah, the people who were floundering around or still totally engaged with the conflict had less self-awareness and the people who were really making progress in their lives leaving some of the conflict behind or actually addressing it seemed to have more awareness. And, and then I went on my own path too, because I said I, we separated three years ago and I was going through my own stuff, came across mindfulness meditation, and it really woke me up because I got to a place where I realized, oh, all this stuff, is here whether i look at it or not so as painful as it is to look at it i might as well look at it that might also be what's happening during covid people have a lot more time to sit there and look yeah nowhere else to look except netflix you've burned through all everything on netflix now you just <laughs> got to look at your relationship and your partner and go Ooh, that's right this is not that's going right. anywhere what am i going to do about this yeah so anyway, that's how I came to that. And I thought, you know, if I could help people with part of this self-awareness thing, and I noticed that also when people are really aware of um, not what they think they should do, but really in tune with what they need, what their kids need, what the other person needs to be able to move forward, that they make much more progress they give me a lot better instructions i don't get instructions like you know i want you to sue so and so and take this and take that actually i don't get that many of those kinds of instructions anyway but it's you're really talking about all of the important stuff in your life when you're talking about divorce so it behooves one to really do a lot of introspection and make sure you do it to uh, figure all of things out what's important to you yeah d framed this for me really well once and i saw it in a um an instagram post recently like just this week about framing it more like a business than a personal transaction like you, it's your home it's your children it's like all the stuff that really matters in your in your life and so just really being pragmatic and thoughtful about it rather than thinking about anything, sort of wrapping all the personal stuff into it. Um, sorry, Dee, I feel kind of okay with me saying that, but I think that's a really good um, approach. I'm just going to say that differently just in case Dee doesn't want me to use that. No, no, no. <laughs> it's fine. I, the reason I have this weird, the reason I have this yeah, weird have look on my look, face. I'm like, okay, well, well if yeah, I, I was may. not supposed to say that. I will back. Is it? No, I was, I'm in reverse. <laughs> and can I get some cornflakes <laughs> and beer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me explain. It's just because I was like, so proud of my business model, like my pragmatic business uh, framing. But then I was, I was in like a, like a counseling session, like very recently and describing something using my, you know, business framework. And the counselor was like, you know, you're using a lot of business language to describe this, you know, very personal and emotional issue. And I said, well, yeah. And she's like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's a mixed, mixed bag, but yeah, that's mixed one bag. way. Yeah. I was like, well, it works for me. <laughs> that's funny. That is funny. We both have the same therapist. She was D's first, but I haven't been in a long time. So I'm going to have to go and talk to her about that and see, cause I agree. I wish I had done that. I did not do that path. And I wish I had to be a bit cleaner and shorter. You know what? I think it's useful when you're trying to like deescalate yes. conflict and, and sort of when emotions are not helpful. I think this was, you know, her comment was more in a situation where like I needed to sort of acknowledge emotional stuff more. And I was trying to stop not, being a, stop to being a business it. robot and be a human goddamn yeah, it. Yeah. But, I go through, I go through yes, but, too. Yeah. 
emotional stuff. Yeah, but there are situations where, you know, emotion, uh, emotional stuff gets in the way and works against you. And sometimes it's better to just be able to put them put them in a box. But I have a question for you, Aurora, about, about the mindfulness thing. So are you saying that when you, you, you were saying that with sort of these high conflict people or people who display these high conflict sort of tendencies, that it's it's kind of a fool's errand to try to make them aware that they have these tendencies. But are you saying that um, by introducing mindfulness strategies that these high conflict people sort of, def- you know, it, that it diffuses their response? Or are you saying that you just noticed that the people who were doing well, who weren't these high conflict people were doing mindfulness or doing uh, self-awareness and that kind of encouraged you to, to take it on? I would say I could sum it up with, I think that if one is mindfully aware and is able to have like a daily mindfulness practice that helps them stay, helps give them some space, uh, I can talk about that more too, but um, that they have a much better chance of remaining in integrity, being who they really are, staying with their bedrock core values, even if the other person can't. I love that phrasing, remaining in integrity. I think that's like something like instead of live, laugh, love or whatever crap people have on their walls, that's what we need to see when you're going through that situation is like, what do I want to look back on and, and not be like, what was I doing? Who Why did that? I do that? Yeah. <laughs> who, who was it that? It can be so tempting to, it can be tempting to be mm-hmm. petty. Vindictive. But it works against you. You know, it's, you're not, you're not doing yourself any favors. You don't feel good about it later either. Like that's the other part too. You have to live with yourself, right? The other thing about uh, mindfulness practice is there's this idea of uh, non-judgment, which does not mean not judging people for bad things that they do. It means that when you do something petty yourself or you find yourself in an unhelpful, unhealthy thought pattern or something like that, you don't go, ah, you idiot Mm -hmm. (laughs) to yourself. You gently guide yourself back to present and that's where keeping an eye on your core values is really important like you guide yourself back to here you don't reprimand yourself my favorite is you don't reprimand yourself for reprimanding yourself <laughs> like being Let's in one of those meta, meta levels here now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and yeah it, it helps you then so that when you do something petty or are not on track for yourself you can come back and start again you know, you can see how quickly things escalate when you start texting, you know, you get a text and you're in conflict and then you just fire something back and then back back. And then all, before you know it, you've said all these ugly things or, you know, there's actually software yeah, screenshot. you can screenshot. use for co-parenting and, and divorce and whatnot that will like read your message and be like, well, this is a little aggressive. Do you the want tone. to change your wording? Yeah. The tone, the tone meter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if that's a problem. I want to, there are tech solutions for that yes, <laughs> or just have are. your friend lock your phone away. That's yeah. another option. Someone said to me, uh, one of my friends, she said that I thought these were wise words. She's like, you know, if, if someone, if someone triggers you with a, you know, with something that they're saying, your response in the moment is never what it would be if you waited 12 hours. That's what she said. She's like, I guarantee, you know what you want to say? If you put your phone down for 12 hours, you'll say something totally different. And I try to adopt that, even if it's just like, were we sending messages to each other? Like, it was like, if you want to say that to him, say it to me instead kind of thing. And it's just, it's not about the, the person receiving the message. It's more just getting about getting the message out and getting that negativity and that response out, whether or not it's received and it's probably better not received. Yes. Like you can journal it, but I love that idea of a buddy system. That is, there's a lot of safety in that, like in terms of, like you said, like not blasting, you know, necessarily who you want to blast and doing something bad to yourself in the process. Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah, like what you said about, you know, meditation. Um, Meditation itself, to me, is a practice of my brain wandering off and me trying to pull it back over and over and over again. Yes, that's that's what it is. Yeah, that's mindful meditation. (laughs) Great, I'm I'm fantastic (laughs) at it then, if it's just about pulling yourself back over and over and over again. And that, to me, yeah, you're pulling yourself, as you're saying, remain in integrity, pulling yourself back into integrity over and over. And as time goes on, it gets easier to stay in those integral thoughtful as Dee's talking about like 
not reactive in that moment where it's you're going to regret it later kind of moments. I think there's there's a lot of value in that. But we're so trained in our work life and our personal life. You get a text message, you respond. You get an email, you respond. You get a ping on Slack. Yeah, so we're trained to auto respond, and that might not be applicable or. might, that might not be the best solution in this dynamic, right? That's right. And in fact, back to the, like, what kind of instructions people give their lawyer, think about that same text, if that was your instructions, and if it changes that much in 12 hours, like, if there's anything at all you can do to get yourself into that 12-hour headspace instead of that instant thing when you are, oh, I don't know, paying hundreds of dollars an hour for something. (laughs) So I'm not telling you one day, sue his ass and next day saying, no, we're getting back together. And then the next day saying, (laughs) we're selling the house, but we're we're gonna buy a new one. Like it's just, you have to, yeah. And I've heard also people saying, you know, some people treat their divorce lawyers like therapists, where a lot of it is just the venting and the ranting, where uh, you could pay a therapist less. And and, <laughs> so, and have it be more effective. Yeah, so that so you're familiar with that. Okay. Oh, yes. That's the other the other one of the other reasons why I started integrating mindfulness, because I was like, okay, this is something that really can't do any harm unless the person has trauma or something. And then they can still find ways of doing mindfulness practice, but talk to your counselor about it and get some help there. But also it's something that I actually can give my clients to do and direct them to and teach them a little bit about. And I've even done it at the courthouse. You know, Um, I've had even, you know, a client in the middle, like we're partway through a hearing and uh, we take a break. So we end up out in a private room talking and, you know, Uh, why is my heart racing like this and blah, blah. And I'm able to say, well, that's adrenaline. It's probably going to take about 18 to 20 minutes to even leave your system. And you'll probably notice that it will get triggered again, but at least, you know, it doesn't mean something bad is actually happening. And here are some, here are some exercises that you can, you see, you can use some of um, yoga positions and things also pretty basic ones to uh, change you know, where your body, how your body is oriented to give your, let your body do its own messaging of like, oh, the, my blood pressure is going up because my head is between my knees. So I need to calm my blood pressure down. And you don't have to necessarily think your way through everything. You can use your body to help you calm down as well. So, you know, situations like that, I've definitely... (laughs) But people have asked me, Aurora, are you still doing that yoga law? Yeah. <laughs> yoga law. <laughs> hey, everything needs a new trend. That's the next trend, <laughs> yoga law. We weren't <laughs> doing downward dog at the courthouse or anything like that. Just... I want to see that in court. <laughs> yeah. I Your do Honor, too. <laughs> Your Honor, we're just going to take a moment to do a warrior pose. You might like to join this us. This would work well with your, your mini skirt and high heels. <laughs> totally. Nothing like yoga and mini skirts, let me tell you. Right in front of the judge. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's get started. So Dee had a question about what it's like at dinner parties, being a divorce lawyer, going to like, you know, like, hey, doctor, check my rash. Do you see what yes. ask, exactly your, ask your question? Like that. Yeah. Well, I guess she's already figured it out. It is exactly like that, actually. So, so I think the phrase is, oh, I bet you've never heard anything like this. And then they tell me, like, really not a very exciting divorce story. (laughs) But they frame it like it's salacious. So it's like, you're benefiting from the story. They don't need your legal advice. They are not soliciting (laughs) it. They are just trying, they are there. You're benefiting from their experience that's right you. that's right How, is that just super I awkward that must be so awkward is that just like crazy awkward people start telling you their stuff yes well and that's that self-awareness thing too right is like, like, <laughs> knowing what's exciting for you might not be exciting your rash might not be exciting to everybody in this moment mm-hmm. yeah. and your need to get rid of that rash might not be applicable at this social gathering that's intended to be fun and enjoyable for all parties not just those seeking to have well, thanks for making it all about you <laughs> that's right well and that that also is like you know what can you what can you do with this you can you know text your friend you can do your 
meditation and go to counseling. Or pay me. Be five hundred. Well, there's that lovely hour. saying, "Fuck you, pay me." I love that <laughs> phrase because yeah. it's applicable, and I think especially for people, we can talk tomorrow. Bring your checkbook. <laughs> Extra long appointment. <laughs> Just have the little little tap thing in your hand. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> One hand has the wine, the other hand has. The- <laughs> That's the the wine in a gavel shaped glass no anyway Mm -hmm. but I think that's that's one of the things too is that to do actually rewarding work um I don't I don't like to see my clients floundering around with the same problem for a bunch of time you know I don't like to see that it's not progressing I would love to have a little bit more of that thing that some people have where they're like, sure, just, just pay me. I've got the afternoon. Let's go. But, um, but it's not very rewarding. And it does. Yeah. When is it rewarding? What are those moments that you're like, yes, this I'm in my, I'm in my flow state. This is what I meant to do. What are those rewarding moments in your work? Uh, when my clients are really stressed out when they arrive and when they leave, they're saying things like, wow, I feel so much better. That was like a weight off. I hear that one a lot. That was like a weight off. Or um, if I have appointments with people over lunchtime, I always tell them, bring a snack and I will too. I will be eating as well. So please bring food for yourself. And in the beginning, they're, you know, trying not to do that. Um, I mean, people actually dress up sometimes to come and see me because I'm their lawyer. And I just, so I try to dress up because they might be <laughs> dressed up. Yeah, you don't want to show up in your lawyers and, you know, juicy, <laughs> juicy across the ass sweatpants, you know, that'd be a little no. awkward. Yeah. No. I have some with stars on the legs. Those are pretty good, but I have not always run into the office. Just legs up on the desk, cross, yeah. just like, what's your problem? I think it's your self-awareness. <laughs> That's right. $500, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, but... But actually, um, a couple of times I had people say that their tummies were growling and they started eating. And I thought that was really great and learned afterwards when I was doing my yoga teacher training that that is them, their body being in a state of rest and digest. I thought, oh, that's right. That's like the opposite of fight, flight, freeze. Yes, because when you're nervous, you don't want to eat. That's right. Your tummy doesn't even growl. It's like, no, we have to get the heck out of here. (laughs) Yeah, I like that a lot. And um, yeah, just really, it's really rewarding to see people more at peace in their lives. And not just because it's not the stuff. It's not about the stuff. They get all the stuff sorted out and they get their agreement. But it's after that, when they they are in a better place Mm -hmm. and not dead in a better place, but like alive and in a better place. Alive and in a better place. And 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 extra alive, maybe even. Yeah, that's right. And even on the way there, when I can see that, that's the other thing people often do that. Like I'll feel better when I'll feel better when I'm finally divorced. I'll feel better when we have that agreement, when this is all over. And in divorce, you know, if you have kids together, this isn't going to be all over. Mm -hmm. You're going to have things that you have to contend with until they're adults, even beyond that. But what can we do right now to try and help you feel better in your life? Mm -hmm. So we're nearing the end of our time together. So curious, sort of your top three, I'm separating, I'm heading there. What should I do? What are my steps? But just a second. Oh, she, oh, <laughs> before you answer that, before you answer that, I have one more silly question. Um, if you don't mind indulging and if you don't want to, that's also totally okay. But what is the most ridiculous thing you've had someone fight over? You know, like I've heard stories of like napkin rings, like getting into the, you know, itemized list of who gets what and, you know, silly stuff like that. Well, TVs on the lawn might be boring to you, but that's kind of yeah, funny to me. Yeah, that's pretty exciting actually. Yeah. yeah, no, I've seen that and I've seen people do things like destroying each other's houses. Like I'll take this and I'll take this and I'll take the fixtures off the walls and I really need to have this um, heating vent. That's really important. Just vindictive. <laughs> yeah. Just I really need stuff. to have this heating vent. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. What about like what about like custody arrangements for pets and stuff? Do you ever have to do that? That's the other one I was going to say. And actually, oh, what do you see on that front? What's what's going on in the pet custody front? Well, um, I never felt right about telling people. I'm sorry to tell you, but your dog is property. That's a hard That's one to absorb. Not a nice yeah. one because I, you know, 
I have a dog too. I don't really, th I don't think of him that way. He's a family member. But what I have seen in more agreements lately, just in the last six months, is that um, the pet is actually appearing in the body of the separation agreement. So, and, but then the lawyers I've talked to, we, we're sort of chatting amongst ourselves saying, where is the most appropriate place to put this in a separation agreement? Do you put the dog right with the parenting plan for the kids or, you know, mm -hmm. and actually that's where, that's where the it. dog has been going. My dog is in my agreement. Yeah. Yes. And I think it was like kids, house, dog. I think yes. that's the order that it came in. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so it's just, that's the thing about agreements is just being respectful of, of, uh, people and your dog can certainly help you with that mindful thing. Um, being where you are. I'm designing a course right now. Can I tell you very shortly about that? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. it's on Please. point. I'm not sure what it's going to be called, but the... the May I recommend beer and cornflakes? <laughs> that'll be in there for sure. <laughs> but it's all about, you know, you are here. But you know, when you're looking at one of those maps and there's the little dot and you could really use like a giant orange arrow where... You need the I? flashing, but yes. 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 So how to figure out where the heck you are now, um, where you want to be, where the path is to that, and how to get yourself back to the path again and again, because you wander off and you might not notice for days, weeks, or months. If you are and for how yes. long. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How far back to where you want to be. It's like strategic planning, but like for your own yeah, life. That's right. But D's, D's therapist says, don't do that. Yeah. Don't, don't bring up the business metaphors, D. Don't you dare. Well, okay. <laughs> but I, I can see a practical use case. Yes. He's using words for business using metaphor or for business applications here. Yeah. Is that, is this a B2B or B2C play? What are we doing here? We need a few projections. <laughs> model for this. Model for this. <laughs> What's your runway? What's your runway? Your sound yeah. player does sound direct, which is nice. So please send me a, <laughs> your sending me a name. I'm always looking for people to refer to. Oh gosh. And, and sorry. And I missed something else that we wanted to talk about. <laughs> okay. Two things. Gray divorce. Does that mean anything to you? Yes. What is gray divorce? I wish it were called silver divorce. Silver um, fox divorce. Ex that is, you took the word Steve out of my Carell, but yes. he's not divorced, but silver fox. Yeah. You got it. Exactly. And so this was D's, is... D's thing. D has got her finger on the pulse of the gray divorce. Um, Scene, scene. <laughs> yeah, well, it's really a thing, um, and it has its own. It's old, older people, uh, sometimes seniors, separating. But the thing is, they're in a different situation because they often have made all of their income for their entire life. Mm -hmm. they, they're retired, and it was based on their plans were based on you know having one household to operate for the two of them and sharing their resources and things. And then what happens when you have to divide that? It's terrifying. Talk about stuff getting real. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, my stomach kind of took a little <laughs> there. <That's... laughs> Tune in yeah, next I'm week. Not hungry anymore. <laughs> That's where you're like, okay, greeter at Walmart starting yeah. next week. <laughs> You know, like now, <laughs> you yeah. have to get ready in case. Yeah, that's daunting. Yeah, it's one thing when you're younger with kids and that, that whole thing, but it's another thing when your sort of earning years are in the in the rearview mirror behind you. you. Yes, that's when you just find someone way younger and you shock up with them, <laughs> sugar mama, and get yes. a. Uh cohabitation agreement <laughs> oh yeah yeah and i had a question about that too but i guess we're running <laughs> no, short no, on we're time go, go, go until she's like guys i'm you're not over bored. time i'm billing for, guys, i'm billing for you now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we said fuck you pay me and then we're like can we talk to you longer yeah. except we need more advice. Be in the mail tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> send it to d how much grief does having a prenup save a couple i mean i know it doesn't save any of the emotion well a lot of the emotional sort of pain but, but the logistical you know, pain as far i as guess the process it can save quite a lot, actually. A lot of people who have cohabitation agreements will follow them at the end. And the other thing is that I... Oh, she's laughing. I want to know more. And Sophie and I have been trying to come up with a better metaphor than this, but I can't yet. So if either of you comes up with one, let me know. Okay, so I, I think of a cohabitation agreement as like a condom for your new life together. But like a full body condom, not just the like dick. Like a full like life full, one. Yeah. 
Yes. So that you, your stuff, your junk is taken care of and you can just have a good time together. You don't have to worry about, oh, is it what happens if both our names go on? Oh, I think she's been using that car a lot. And I'm, uh, you know, what about, okay, we're buying a house. It's all stressful, right? So if you have some rule book beforehand, you know, you can always change them as you go along too. They can evolve with you. So yeah, they can save quite a bit of, I think they can save trouble at the legal end and if they're done properly if they're done as a an agreement between you know respectful adults who care about each other and don't want each other to worry maybe it can even reduce the stress in your relationship yeah it's funny to me how people well, i mean i didn't have one but it but now in retrospect it's funny to me how people don't have them because of the sort of once bitten twice shy so many people get them the second time around because they see how much it would have helped them the first time you know i guess it's just that it doesn't feel romantic or something or people just don't want to do it or they don't think that they need to do it do you see that though to... clients coming back sorry go ahead you continue first and then i'll interrupt you again Sure. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think, okay, ask the question one more time. I don't remember my question. <laughs> okay. well, sorry, it was my fault. But what I'm curious about is, do you see your clients who have been through a divorce ever coming back sort of for the second time around being a bit more conscientious about cohabitation agreements and prenups and things like that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So see, we're, all, was, we're on the same page. It's all mind world here. We're all good. Yeah. So for one, uh, they know a lot more. When people are getting married, especially the first time, they have no idea what they're agreeing to. Like they're, they're agreeing, you know, they're not thinking of like what that for better or for worse thing might actually look like, or they're thinking about it. But once you're in a divorce, you're like, whoa, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's well, so they always fun. say you don't need a contract when everything goes well. A contract is, is for when shit hits the fan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So if you haven't had shit hit the fan, you don't know what that's like. But once it's hit the fan once and you're looking to go into it again, your eyes are wide open. Yeah, that's, right. that's true. And really marriage, you are signing a contract, but there's no terms, you know, there's no term that's sheet. Right. And I guess that's what the prenup yeah. really is, is yeah. Otherwise you're just, you've just signed, you just signed on the line and like, who knows what you're, yeah. who knows yeah, what I, you're I signing. Saw Again, a meme, it's like 50%, it, there's a 50% chance of you getting half my shit. <laughs> like, basically, <laughs> like things go wrong and you're going to get half my shit. Yes. Based on like the interior of my storage room, I wish that that, had happened <laughs> please take half of my yeah. shit. <laughs> but, only but, uh, the bad half so yeah. i'll keep the good half the heat yeah. event staying with me <laughs> yeah That's fine solid gold so how do you do you see clients doing that and like approaching that topic of hey i've been burned once before let's get this in writing yes and i don't think it's because they don't trust the other person i think um the reason why people one of the biggest reasons why people avoid having a cohabitation agreement is because they think it's going to jinx their relationship somehow. When they're going through it a second time, they're very concerned about like how they're going to discuss things with their partner and making sure that that person is, that they're both protected. And that you're actually capable of having those kind of conversations in your marriage, because if you're not, you probably shouldn't get married. <laughs> Like right. it's like if yeah. you're afraid, that's the kind of the opposite of a mindful approach, isn't it? Like you're if you're so afraid to talk about this topic, is the answer to move in together? <laughs> I understand your I understand your condom metaphor now. So you what you're saying. She's, is been, she's been thinking about it this whole time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have. Well, you, the idea is, you know, you're taking the you're taking the um you're taking the risk out of the trend, and then just the <laughs> focusing just on the fun it. part. It's exactly. The fun part. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's taken care of. So yeah. Or Scotch guard. It's like Scotch guard <laughs> for your coach. It just, those things don't have the same, like we let's go have a good time now. D and I have a, uh, an environmentally friendly variation, which is those bees racks, beeswax wraps. We focused on Obigo, Obigo. <laughs> specifically beautiful Victoria company, love their products, but just using that <laughs> so that it's more eco-friendly. A, a beeswax right. wax condom right. instead. So it's more eco-friendly than latex. <laughs> so Obigo, call us. We've got big ideas. <laughs> and then you just rinse it, it rinse it, and use water, it again. It's all good. It, it bends to the shape. And I mean, right. come on, it's a dream. And it might actually work better in this circumstance. In, in this circumstance, I think it's better metaphorically, 
<laughs> realistically, scientifically, there might be some shortcomings, but that's not our, we're, Abiko would be so happy to know, you know, that they're being used. They're now the poster product for prenups and condoms and STI prevention. I could design a reusable <laughs> prenup. I don't think that's been done before. <laughs> and then it's, you can illustrate the metaphor with the prenup. So look, it's on the beeswax. Like, check this out. Just put it on whiteboard, whiteboard material, so you can just rub the person's name out and write the next person's name in. You can use it again and right. again. What Jim Bob didn't like this deal? Who's next? <laughs> Wipe them out. Um. So yeah. So top three things that somebody who's contemplating um, separation, what should they do before they go and send angry texts? What's the first step? They should definitely get legal advice from their own lawyer. Um, they should ask all the questions that they need to before they take, like truly, before they do anything, because everything else they do is going to be based on their understanding of, you know, what their rights and obligations are and things. People are usually trying to do things right, but they might be a little ham-fisted about it. Find out how to help your kids through this process. Find out from a professional. Believe the professional. <laughs> There's a lot of really good information out there on the internet. Yes. And we are going to ask you to send us resources and sure. we will post those on our website with this episode. So any books, anything that you love, uh, Aurora's recommendations, we will share with you all. Awesome. I will be happy to do that. Because good information is better than just guessing and, and going based on old cliches like, what's the thing again? Preparation is no. Possession? Possession is nine tenths of what see we've already forgotten it we're so good now you said to forget it we forgot it it's long gone good letting it go all i'm thinking about is abigo wraps that's all i'm <laughs> focused on right now right <laughs> and also selecting your support network very mm -hmm. quickly you do not need negative cheerleaders even though they sometimes might feel good it's uh better to have friends who are good listeners who will be yeah, friends, counselors, everybody. Like I said, your counselor sounds like direct and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, friends that calm you down versus friends that wind you up. But I guess you said negative cheerleaders, same thing. But you know, you don't you don't wanna you know, start venting to a friend and have the and leave like twice as fired up as you were before. You right? should go I mean, to his house right now. <laughs> pound the door down. Take all the heating vents. <laughs> get the heating vent, get his TV, put it on the lawn. <laughs> I don't yes. know if I'm allowed to say this or not, but I remember getting a phone call from Aaron once just saying, I'm calling you now because if I called you 20 minutes ago, you would have told me not to do what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so the advice from yeah. the divorce lawyer is All call, your friend, and call your friend 20 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that exactly, but it sounds accurate. It involves, it involves. Could have been blocked out. <laughs> anyway, yeah. moving on to other people's problems. <laughs> But yeah, that's another thing is be gentle with yourself. Like if you're tough times and people do, you know, their own version of crazy wild stuff. And uh, thank you for validating yeah. my experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then just come back. <laughs> come back. Return to that integrity, regain that's that integrity. Right. Yes. That's as long as you come back, that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And um, I, I just want to say thank you so much for um, answering our questions. I love the approach. I love the the positive um, twist on the whole the whole thing because that's really really what it is, and that's what we I think D would back me up on this. You're here to celebrate sort of the life after and what comes next and making it amazing and awesome. And so thank you so much for making the time. Oh, thank you for having me. That's what I loved about. I looked up your podcast, and I love that you have a lighter side, but it's still it's the reality of things and. Um, I think this is one of the things people need to see is that divorce is not only survivable, but it might be what you need to have a good life for yourself. I'm going to call it thr thrivival. 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 Thrivival by Abigo. 
I might have to contact them. Make sure I can include all these references. They're going to, they're going to start getting called. If a bingo contacts you to sue our asses, please do not. Yeah. <laughs> How is the prophylactic? <laughs> and I just, I think the biggest thing to the biggest takeaway here is uh, right, do your own breaking up. Do not hire a lawyer to break That's up true. one for you. That won't go well. Yeah. Erin and I will do that for you for a nominal fee. <laughs> Yeah. If you want to, yeah. This is the thing. From now on, if anyone reaches out to you wanting that service, you reach out to us. We'll take care of it. We'll no call problem. them on that. We'll call them on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I find it's best if you're going to dump someone. An audience is key. It's a key right. factor. <laughs> right. Yeah. You won't have the same confidentiality issues. No, we have no <laughs> issues. We have no credentials, and we have no one we have to report to. We have no accreditation. No attorney client privilege no, here. There's, yeah. no, there's yeah. no privilege whatsoever. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, guys. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Yes, and, thank you. Uh, and yeah. stay in your integrity. Go be mindful and yes. and, and shit. Eat your cornflakes. <laughs> yes. Drink your okay. beer. Have an awesome evening, too, and thank you so much. Good night. Thank you so much for making the time to listen. We know you have way too much going on. If you can spare a little more time though please follow us on instagram and facebook at demarried life or visit us at demarriedlife.com for all of our episodes articles and lots of other great ideas for living a post-married life that isn't a total shit show see you there